conversation around what is a resource because the actual definition of wealth is an abundance of money possessions or resources okay so we considered more resources to be more than like copper in buildings and gold and so forth so thinking through what are the resources that we have to build a life or we have to build a company mm -hmm. right and obviously purpose is the first thing that we have on the with wealth will because that's the beginning of all of what somebody is doing is that if they align their efforts with their purpose, that's actually what drives them forward in a way that everything that they do from here on out brings them joy and satisfaction. Gotcha. Right? So what we don't, what we don't promote anyways, other people can do it and it's awesome if that's what they want to do, but we don't promote an individual making money for the sake of making money because then what are they really using their time for? They're not actually spending their time in anything that really brings them a lot of joy other than in the process of getting the money to then go do what they really want to do which i always thought it was super awkward which is the whole thing like people want to go get retired right and they spend their life trying to move themselves toward retirement so they spent all those years working to make money so they can actually then do what they want to do right, right. so for us purpose and how much someone is aligned with purpose so we broke that up into two two sub pieces so it's impact and goals so i'll speak on the goals one so we we relate uh, how well is somebody actually re reaching their goals as part of the overall goal for purpose because you can have a purpose you can want to have to make impact but if you're not actually reaching your goals to make things happen then you're actually not creating a lot of results so or you could be reaching all your goals but not necessarily driving a lot of impact they have to align right right what do you mean so by align your goals have to align with Ah, impact yes. and purpose and your impact and then they also have to align with the other components of the wealth wheel right so right for creativity sure and do you want to talk about the impact though yeah so impact is what are you doing with your purpose what are you doing with your life is it um, that you're going out and making a difference in the world are you um, supporting other people in their growth or are you just all about yourself and what you're doing in your world and how things improve your life. So we believe that you have to really include a tribe and a community um, to really be living a purpose and also beyond that to be giving back to the greater good of the world so that we're giving back to the next generation and the next generation and the next next generation. What is it, seven generations that we you Yeah, I love that. I love yeah. that. So that seven generation brand. Are you familiar with them? Mm -mm. I don't love it. Because yeah. you, you hate small companies. I do. I'm known for that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so. <laughs> well, and isn't it a Native American thing? Yes. So there's a brand that you can buy and they sell soap and. Laundry I, I detergent. A bunch, bunch of stuff. Stuff Toilet for your paper. house. Hmm? Toilet paper, paper towels. It goes in your bathroom. That's generally what I know about it. Kitchen, bathroom, utility yeah. room. And, and, and there's a whole thing on their, let me see if I can find exactly what they say on their website. Um, what's a seven generation? Well, apparently they sell seven generation diapers. Yeah. I don't want diapers that are gonna last for seven generations. Hell Change no, your no kids. stinky. Oh my God. <laughs> Check every hour. But. Otherwise you won't have a shiny hiney. <laughs> <laughs> or Scarlett yeah, said, shiny, 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 I have a shiny, shiny. Yeah, because we changed you, we didn't get rashes. Definitely highlights. <laughs> <laughs> no, the scary thing was, or not scary, embarrassing thing would be in the grocery store, and she would scream it out. <laughs> I need a shiny, shiny, I'm getting rashes. Like, Which probably was, because that kid ate more fruit than like, I don't know, the fruit bat. So yeah, it would be very embarrassing because then she would want to tell people what it meant. And yeah, see, yeah. So on their website it says that we have lots of beliefs. So this is on seventh seventhgeneration.com, 
and their mission. And it says, we have lots of beliefs, but the biggest one is that we have a responsibility to this generation and the next seven. Yes. So everything they do, they consider this generation and what would happen seven generations from now. So if I don't have kids, do I have to worry about it? Yes, because you're going to leave an impact for the next seven generations of people. This should be so lucky. And it's based on the ancient Iroquois, mm -hmm. Iroquois, Iroquois. Iroquois. Yeah, philosophy that the decisions we make today should result in a sustainable world. Pocahontas Iroquois? Oh, I don't know. I think Pocahontas is the new term for Elizabeth Warren. Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> She's one, one one millionth Pocahontas. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, Iroquois? So I'm not sure actually. It doesn't say on the website if it is an Iroquois. I looked it up. Thought. It does. Oh, it is? Yes. The seventh generation principle comes from the Iroquois philosophy. It's the great law of Iroquois Confederacy <laughs> form the political, ceremonial, and social fabric of the five nation Confederacy. And it but where were they physically the located? Uh, in America. Um. So it dates back, oh wow, the first recorded concepts of seven generation principle date back to the writing of the great law of Iroquois Confederacy. Although the actual date is undetermined, the range of conjecture place it's writing anywhere from 1142 to 1500 AD. 1142 to 1500, wow. You should put that link in the, the chat. Okay. That's incredible. In the chat on Twitch? Yes. Yep. If I can find my mouse, I will. We had a, we had, there were a few people that joined the stream, and they joined the stream in the middle of the shiny, shiny. I'm confused as to what's going on here. <laughs> Nobody explained what it means. <laughs> oh. There's a lots of things that were not placed there properly. <laughs> you know, the impact I had on Scarlett is that she understands hygiene. This is very true. This is, this For many generations, true. there will be little Morton kids running around worried about their shinies and hineys being shiny. She was very disappointed when she realized she was not going to have a penis. Yeah. Aren't we all? She was very disappointed in that concept. She was like, at any moment, this is going to grow, right? So when she realized it wasn't, it was, she was devastated. So that was, an so, so that was a goal that she set unconsciously when she was a kid. That's yeah. interesting. Okay, so like tying this back into the conversation about like goals and impact. I was trying to, but I like, couldn't get there. Like, well, I'm, I'm thinking like, okay, so what does the realization that a goal is unachievable mean for like its uh, impact on like you as a person you or like you as a, a business? Like, because I think that happens a lot where we like, especially for like when in early education, people like, you know, as your kid in your first yeah. grade, they say, what do you want to be? And everyone's like, I want to be the president, I want to be a scientist. And then like, I wanted to work at Wendy's. <laughs> what happens when? Shoot low. Yeah, like, well, what happens when? Achieve you your goals like, and avoid disappointment. Oh do god, it. this is really hard. Yeah. Yeah. Well, not even that it's really hard, but that it really does not fit you. Like, there's just no way that you're gonna be. Like for me, there's no way I was gonna run a four-minute mile. I'm not mm -hmm. even gonna run a ten-minute mile, like right. or a twenty-minute. Maybe if I have a scooter, go down. If I'm in a car, but yeah. like I knew that I don't have that. Even as hard as I push myself, it wasn't going to happen. I didn't ever have that goal, but I'm just saying, when you really, when you technically, physically, mentally, when you just don't have that capability, mm -hmm. yeah, what does that feel like? Yeah, I mean, you also need to redefine your goals because, like, part yeah. of setting a goal is, is this something mm. I can attain? It's that reflection piece mm. that we have in our wheel, also. Yeah. That's be interesting. realistic. Shoot, like, stretch yourself, but also be realistic. Because I usually. For me setting goals, I usually try to figure out what am I going to what am I going to gain in the process of trying to achieve this goal and is that something that I can take with me somewhere else, right? So like if I want to run the, the four minute mile, if I can at least take away better health and like cardio, cardiovascular health, then great. Yeah. Whether or not I actually reach the goal. Yeah. Um, because if there's nothing I can take away from trying to achieve the goal that I can use somewhere else, then that is actually a really useless goal. Right. Or that you can't make impact with that goal. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know. I think through that I'm, I'm constantly reevaluating my goals and thinking through, do I still want this? Does it, is it still relevant? And I think we do that here all the time. Yep. I mean, it's, I think for Abe and I, it's probably kind of crazy for everyone else because they're like, yeah, that goal doesn't really seem relevant anymore. Let's try this one. <laughs> 
Well, you know what? I, I think it's... Um, I think it's interesting that the vast majority of entrepreneurs or people in general are just so scared to make a mistake. Yeah. And in that conversation we had um, around investor funds and whatever, I think it was Thursday night? Was it Thursday yeah. night? Yeah. Wednesday. So that was the thing, like, what's the right move? What is the right thing? What is the, and I think all the panelists were like, we don't know. Yeah. And I think it's just that willingness to be able to move out and Sometimes just do a thing. Do a thing. But I think do, do a, work. my thing is do a thing, but maybe try to ask some input from some professionals yeah. and experts around you so you don't do a catastrophic thing a on minute thing. number one. Yeah. I right. think I liked what, I liked, you know, Craig saying take action, action, action. I love that. But we've also taken action without really setting that goal and the intention and thinking through things. They have to be combined, otherwise you, like you, you say said, all the time, you're going the wrong direction, you might be going the wrong direction. But you said something really good when we were talking about that, I think later that evening or, or whatever, was the action we took led us to this action. True. So we can't go backward and analyze that one time where we didn't do anything because that's obviously was needed to get us to where we are now. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But generally, I would just say if an entrepreneur is going to start, it doesn't matter what you're an entrepreneur or not. If you're going to get out and start doing some stuff and you are wanting to be forward biased on action, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's not a bad idea to just pause for one second, ask somebody else around that's got some experience and say, do you think this is the next logical move based on the information that I have? Right. That's it. That's all you have is the next logical move and the next move that makes sense. And then well, after and that, I, you would just move forward. I think you have to restate that and it really does need to be an expert or at least someone who has some experience That's in that and not your mom or brother. Right, well, I love when you talk about the proximity. The experts. expert versus proximity yes. advice? Yes. Yeah, because we all do that. We, we look to the person right around us that we love and we care for and they care about us and we ask them about our business ideas. What makes yeah. you think they could advise you on business? Right. And I remember one specific phone call. I was driving home, and um, uh, you know this guy you know, he wanted to branch out and do his own CPA business. He said, "Well, I was talking to my wife, and she was concerned about this, or not sure about that, and this, right?" And I just asked him, like, "Can you tell me how many business?" I was like, "Not trying to be an asshole, just curious. How many businesses have you, has your wife started?" Mm -hmm. Well, none. Well, how many has she failed? None. How many is she currently involved in? None. And then I just paused for a second and I just, you know, how blunt I can be. I was just like, so I've been doing this shit for like 25 years and I have to work, I'm in, in one of your ears and in the other ear, somebody who's never actually done anything other than have a job. Right. Like, how does that make any sense? Right, to take the advice from someone that hasn't even attempted to do something so they have some experience. Yeah, I'm like, I'm not even saying I'm good at it. Let's just say I failed in 25 years of business. At least I could tell you some shit that I failed on versus right. somebody who has zero experience. So actually you should roll into that because we got a question on the uh, the channel of what our general, our general experience is. So like if each one of us go through and say what our background is. So like that's a perfect segue. Like you're at 25 years of business. So my, my entrepreneurship started when I was a teenager because um, I did, we, did, we grew up without any money. So we grew up in Arlington and this was the way my brother and I would help our parents actually kind of do projects that, would, that they brought home so that they could interact, um, so they could pay for college, I'm sorry. So they would get different side hustle jobs and we would help them and we would get paid too. So that was the way for my brother and I. Uh, my brother is, so I'm 39 and my brother is 37. So, you know, pretty close gap right there. And so that's how we end up making some side money and then what ended up happening after that is we started to realize that we had these skills and so we could, you know, kind of job with a neighbor, tell somebody, yeah, we can fix your car or whatever it was. And that's how we were making money. So in that sense, it was more hustling than actually entrepreneurship in the sense of like creating a business to grow. Mm -hmm. But I've been doing it ever since then. And then even through college, I paid for my own college. My brother um, and I had started a networking business and we were doing computer repair and stuff as teenagers. And that rolled into a business while we were in college. And he, you know, in high school and college, um, and then ultimately I got a degree in electrical engineering, and I did flight test engineering for four years at Bell Helicopter, and from 2001 to 2005. In October 03, my brother launched Social Smoke, uh, which is around today. It's 16 years old now, almost 16 years old. And that business um, started off in his bedroom. It started off with him maxing out his credit card. He put like four thousand dollars for an inventory purchase. Uh, on his credit card and then I would I would help him nights and weekends starting at about kind of like November 
I remember it was always Christmas break, uh, Thanksgiving break that I got introduced to where the business was at the time and where he needed some help. And I thought, I said, I don't know anything about eBay, but maybe we could sell some stuff on eBay. And so I started running the eBay store that ultimately got to about 5,000 a month in revenue, something like that before we killed it off. Uh, and I started doing wholesale accounts and setting up a wholesale business with him uh, nights and weekends after my engineering job during the daytime. And that was like through 04, and then in 05, um, I needed to, it, I was just at a, I had to, I, we, we were like stuck, because the business was growing so much, but we were also, um, you're talking to the camera. To the stream, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody asked a direct question, so yeah. I thought, who am I gonna answer here? Might as well talk to the person who asked the question. So it was a very long-winded conversation, but figured to give you all the details. So in 05, Ed left my engineering job, and that was super scary because at the time, I was making a lot of money uh, working in Maryland because they gave me like per diem money, and they gave me a rental car, and they gave me all this other stuff to, to do that. So I was like, t between the ages of 24 and 26, approximately, I made like 230,000, so lots of money. I saved the vast majority of it, uh, well, a lot of money. I saved about 75,000 in cash that I put into the business, and, um, Max out my 401k, and then the rest of the money I was I paid on. I finished all my student debt within the first I think nine months of working at Bell. So, anyways, left the business, left Bell Helicopter to work with my brother. But there was not an equal jump in pay at all. Like I went to very very low money uh, working with my brother. Sometimes some months we didn't get paid at all, and we really started doing to to rack up credit card debt as we were funding our life, but also taking out um, balance transfer offers. On, on the credit cards so that we could then put that money into the business. And that took years, I think it took from 2005, so it's almost 10 years actually, which is a really interesting number. I hear that very often in entrepreneurs that it takes about 10 years for the business to really just start thriving and being successful and being profitable. And it took Social Smoke right about 10 years from uh, 03 to 2013 to all of a sudden it's like, wow, we can breathe and it's going well and we're paying down debt. and and so forth. So that's my background. And and, um, and then in 2000, well, I guess I could say from 2015, I got an offer to leave the day to day. I sold some shares back to my family. And then I was really kind of confused and lost for a long time. I didn't know what my purpose was. Or a different way to say that is that I had these ideas of what I wanted to do, but I wasn't, I had the, I lacked the confidence and I lacked uh, the know how to make it happen. And so I spent a long, long time there researching things and figuring things out and working with stuff and finding out I didn't want to do that. I want to do something else. And then Janica and I met and um, well, I, I met somebody else and we started doing a lot of, a lot of work together in creating content and getting, um, not being scared of the camera and all those kind of things. And then I met Janica and we started hanging out. Two years out. ago today. I mean, that's... And really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Two years ago today? <laughs> yeah, two years ago today was the capacitor. No. And, yes. And you were coming from Macarios? Yes. Macarios yeah. Community School. Right. So, I mean, good segue. Your background before meeting Abe was... Was... Miserable. Was, horrible. <laughs> boring. Oh, my God. There was just no purpose to life. <laughs> there you go. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. So, before Abe, um, really, I was just looking this up. In high school, like on my senior yearbook, you, you, you know, you write your little quote when you're, mm -hmm. at least we did, and it was to travel the world, being an international businesswoman, drive an awesome Lamborghini Countach, and live on the beach. So, I mean, I got some of that happening. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> A lot of it's in my dreams. But those are still kind of my goals. And I think through like what's gotten me here, um, I've never been able to just enjoy a day-to-day -day that's exactly the same. I go crazy. So when I was working in corporate in the 90s, I took on side jobs and started my marketing and web agency. And that's kept going for 20 odd years now. And uh, along the way, just learning everything I could learn that was interesting to me. I was very curious about all the things. And uh, with my kids, after I had my fourth, we realized like Montessori, Paying for four kids in Montessori is, there's our retirement going bye-bye. So I, we started looking at other options and I realized that they're just, the education system out there, the options were just not anything I liked and wanted for my kids. So we started homeschooling and then unschooling and then from there created Macarius Community School with Donella Seckerly and um, 
that is a self-directed uh, democratic free school. And that is just moved, they have just moved to Fort Worth in a huge campus and it's pretty awesome. Um, but then from there, tried real estate with flipping homes. We did seven homes in a year and that was crazy experience. Learned a lot. Um, <clears throat> started a women's support group called One Broke Bitch where we help moms who hit that middle age where their kids are no longer really needing them and they just don't know what to do with their lives and so they feel broken or lost and um, we get them back on the path and help them discover what their passion and purpose is. And uh, that's about when I met Abe and we were both working on the same concepts in different ways and m decided to merge our companies and take on the world and yeah. <laughs> and here we are. And here we are. It's not really take on the world. It's just we just I, I just want to support people that want to do what they want to do, whether that's a kid or an adult, right? And not be shackled down by concepts that that really just are there to hold them back, right? I no, mean, definitely I just see about there, there's no reason to, to that we have to move in this very specific direction. Yeah. Um, I mean, a lot of that, yeah, because sometimes you fall into that one, right? Like my whole entire. I guess purpose once I was like okay what do I actually want to do was I want to do the stuff that is interesting to me and not be shackled by the idea that like well I can't do this because it's not my job I mean that's it I want to do the things that's interested to me and I don't want the, and, and then why does anybody have to hold you back from that as long as you take the personal responsibility right for all the outcomes that come associated with it yeah. if you want to be a collector of bottle caps Knock yourself out. Be the best bottle cap. You know, there might not be a market for it, and that's right. going to be on you. You shouldn't be, you know, upset at me that if I have some money, m monetary success in that regard, right? Monetary success. Yeah. Because you could still have fulfillment, and I can have fulfillment in my world, but you're upset that I have monetary success and you don't because you decided to do bottle cap collecting. And I, that's I, on you. That's actually, that's something that filters into a lot of what I see like with startup companies when they first start raising money is the first time founder mistake when you're looking to raise money is that someone with money should release it to you because the fact that you want it for the thing you want to do because right. they have it. Give it to me because I have it. And right. And I want it. Right, right, exactly. And I hear that, I mean, you. I hear that so many times, like, you know, we're here in Dallas and Mark Cuban's like the marquee investor and I hear so many people like, well, I should go on Shark Tank and Mark Cuban should give me money because of this great idea. And then, like, when you start actually trying to shop that idea around, people are like, well, how come you're rejecting me? It's like, well, at the end of the day, people don't get money by just randomly giving it away. And so it's ultimately their decision. <laughs> That's right. probably important. You're going to be rich by giving everyone the stupid ideas money. Right. Or even everyone with good ideas money, right? Yeah. So yeah. It's, yeah. it's It can be good. It just may not be it's, fitting his goal for exactly, what he exactly. wants to do. And that's so, the thing that you were saying, like being the best bottle cap collector or whatever. Be whatever your goal of what you define being the best is. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're achieving. Yeah. Because if then, you're trying to live up to somebody else's ideal, you're never going to feel fulfilled and you're going to just go forever and be at the end of your life and be like, oh man, what the hell was I doing? Well, yeah. I don't, know about, I don't know about everybody, and I don't know for our particular entrepreneurs and the way we view life, those people that are fulfilled most likely are also giving back. It's just something yeah. innate in most humans that their desire is to help somebody else. I actually met one of my, a Lyft driver last week really cool guy seems to have a lot of experience in phone sales specifically and selling even phones or selling no 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 selling off, selling through the phone it got started 20 years ago and it was really an interesting story but even that gentleman he said you know one thing people don't like about me when i go to work is i just go to work to make money like i'm there i'm not there to chit chat i'm not there to make friends i'm there to make money for the company and they love me even that very white and black cutthroat type of individual ultimately also said, you know, I just want to help out people. So it just seems to be like no matter what people, most people I've ever met, it's not just for themselves. I, I, I personally don't know anybody myself, mm -hmm. but I said, no, I just want to get rich for myself. No desire to help anybody else, period, nothing. Emily, it's like me. Yeah. Not true. She spends all the time here and then turns around and go and spend hours upon hours at charities, so. Amazing. Yeah, I mean, everyone has a place that they want to help, and it's all personally defined. Well, as we have call on our Facebook chat, this is my other charity, so really, I'm basically <laughs> Mother Teresa, <laughs> <laughs> without the like obsession with you know, suffering, which yeah. is her jam. You know, it, 
it's actually interesting. So like we're talking about goals and like wanting to help and everything, and then that it reminds me of the whole iron triangle piece, which is whatever you want to do is going to fall into a paradigm of time or cost or quality. Mm. And so like there are a lot of people that want to help and they donate their time, like what Emily was talking about. And then there's a lot of other people that are like, well, I want to help and I want to help quickly, but I can't put the time in, so then you give money if you have that resource. And right. That's why you see a lot of charitable donations, aside from the tax write-off that comes with that, and sometimes a party that charity events. I wish I had enough money to get this. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about it. I mean, there's, there are ways of quantifying that if you send invoices for discounted time. That's true. Wait, what? Yeah. So yeah, but you know what Brian would say? Brian, Brian's our corporate yeah. tax attorney. And Actually, Brian needs to be in here for a couple of sessions so we can talk about. Oh, this. God forbid. <laughs> yes, let's have that. That'll be entertaining. Remember he would just say like. Kardashian and thought her ass was going to break the internet. Well, I mean, <laughs> I <ain't doing> that, <laughs> that might. <laughs> Brian, Brian would break the internet yet again. Something we should highlight, Brian. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, but what, what would he say about the whole like discounted? Or- I think he'll just say most people don't ever qualify for taking. Like it's better for them to take the standard deduction. Yes, yes. You than to itemize, and yes. so just it it does never work out. Because I asked them, especially so, for the next two years, because the standard deduction is higher now because we passed a new tax yeah. bill. So I went through the whole thing about asking him about becoming a nonprofit mm-hmm. or creating a nonprofit arm, especially around the charitable contributions for Repeat After Me. Okay. He's like, why? And I explain. He's like, it doesn't fucking make a difference. You know, he said this way. He goes, most of, okay, a business can't take a tax write-off like that unless I think he said they were like C-Corps or some shit. So that was one thing. Right, right. Okay, otherwise it flows back to you anyways. Might as well just take it yourself as an, you know, from an LLC perspective. And if it's your, yes, there's that. And then for you as a person, most people don't ever qualify beyond the, don't, go past the standard deduction anyways. Mm-hmm. So it's like, it doesn't matter. But I'm like, psychologically matters because you know everywhere you go, they're asking you for a $5 donation. They say, and this is a, this is a tax deductible expense. Right, right. And so that was a whole interesting conversation. It's like, it's functionally, it's functionally useless in a sense. Right, until you get to a certain amount of volume. Not even that, it's like the kind of donations you would be taking on. Oh. Because we can get gotcha. we can get to sixty billion dollars a year in donations, but if the people donating the money, they're always on a standard deduction, then it doesn't benefit them anyways. Just let it be. Hmm. Does it make sense? No. Yeah, yeah, that totally makes sense because it's not gonna it's not the comp, it's not the beneficiary that's taking that tax write off. It's the contributor. Right. Mm. Yeah. The beneficiary just gets the money from to be able to t- yes. So then you would have to get to a place where your services are valued at a, a big enough dollar amount to make each hour worth itemizing. Something, yeah. So like, I mean, which is the reason why you see lawyers doing stuff like that. They'll do pro bono work because they're billing at $500 an hour. And so when if you do like eight to nine hours of pro bono work a week, which may be just like a Sunday for you, you can rack up $40,000 of personal. Yeah, we should totally have this as a question for for Brian, I'm not really sure what the answer for that would be. Right, right. So uh, let me see here. Uh, make a note of doing this on a future stream. Well, we can get them in Skype, right? In the future? Yeah, yeah. Tax that's, that's right what I'm saying. Like, we can have uh, volunteer this. hours. Let's see. Why time spent volunteering is not tax deductible. So that's mm-hmm. so the answer. Well, is, I know like when the first two years we launched Macarios. All of the time I invested, like the accountants, like, and I, and I donated pretty much, uh, well, almost everything. For the marketing? Well, that too. Like I paid for all the marketing. Okay. All the platforms, everything. So that stuff I could write off. But the, like all of the school materials, like I had thousands and thousands of dollars in curriculum and materials and furniture I donated. I couldn't, it like, I maxed out at 5,000 is all that I could right, do. Right, that's true. And that There's was probably, probably close to fifteen twenty thousand dollars $20,000 when I went through the you whole, probably, like, You did it wrong, too. You could have probably carried it over or done it in, in tranches. So, like, in 2014, you get this much. In 2015, you'll get this much. And you we, pass over the title of ownership. I don't know. They said they're, we're still working on that. She said... She, 
this was the best I could get. Mm. So, do you, yeah, see, what, do you see what I'm saying? No, I do. Because you don't, you don't, if you don't give it to them, like you loan it to them in 2015 and you give it to them in 2016 and then you give another piece in 2017. Hmm. Well, There's some probably out. way you could play around. You probably have, yeah, that would be a Brian question to ask. Yeah. But you'd be surprised on this, uh, how this stuff um, plays out. Yeah. And the, the IRS tax rules are really interesting when it comes to this income stuff because they really think about exactly where's the transfer of value happening, mm -hmm. right? And, as, and then when does it happen and what are the rules in which it's happening? Um, so there's just assortment of different ways. Um, so we had a question about the rest of our background. So Emily, do you want to go? I was Janny's nanny 14 years ago. And, like uh, nanny to Jeannie? Yes. yes. I needed to be taken care of. <laughs> <laughs> the entire household. <laughs> From birth to whatever age you guys were as the adults in the house. Yeah. So as an 18 year old, I moved across the country and lived with a bunch of weirdos. And then I got Stockholm Syndrome and here I am. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Aside from that, you're also PM, project manager, and yeah, operations. Yeah, officially, unofficially, did project management. Um, I was a corporate babysitter, is how I like to phrase it. I took care of salespeople, <laughs> bless their hearts, um, and essentially just product creation and things like that. So they brought me in, and Jenny and Abe brought me in to be their grown up again. So yes. basically, I'm a professional parent. Yeah. But what do you do on the side with your, oh, with your charity? Um, I am vice president of Debt and Friends with Benefits. Not a sex club, it is a charity. <laughs> Our mission is we do fundraisers and things like that for other nonprofits in the North Texas area, just kind of community building, things like that. So raise money and give to other people. And Ooh, that's awesome. Cool. Basically, where I am when I'm not here. Yeah. I and did you're not know that, so I learned something new today. Yeah. Uh, shorthand version for me is I went to school for broadcast, so a lot of this channel's engineering is you know based on that experience. Uh, wanted to be a newscast, news broadcast director. When I toured all the news channels and I asked them how long it took to be a newscast broadcast director, they said, you know, 20 years, and you can be a cameraman the whole entire time, and that's about 20 grand a year. So that was, sounds good. Really? Yeah. 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 Mm -mm. So I, and most camera guys that work for the news also freelance other places because 20 grand does not cover everything. Um, especially, you know, well, and here in Dallas too, mega churches are everywhere and so they always need camera work. So that's kind of a way you parlay that. Um, so it was actually that knowledge I transitioned into setting up and running broadcasts for churches. Um, did that for like eight years. And concurrently with that, I also worked at UPS and did all of the jobs that you can possibly do there and ended with doing their technology upgrades. and. Really, between freelance broadcast work and UPS, I burned out around mm. 24 ish. And so I was like, I'm going to leave. Quarter life crisis on time. Yeah. A quarter life crisis. It really was. It was a quarter life. <laughs> like, I was like, hey, I'm making like $95,000 a year and I hate all of this and I don't have any time to enjoy it. So I'm going to take the whole 401k and everything and just leave and try some other stuff. And so moved here to Dallas, started a music blog, ran that for three years. Got really obsessed with coffee, bought a coffee shop, sold a coffee shop, did some other stuff, um, and then kind of just did standard freelance research, development, technology, investigation, lots of evaluation of startup companies, and then that's how we met, which was uh, House of Genius. Was, they did a weekly, they did a monthly event that helped companies with their problems. Mm -hmm. And so both me and Abe were helping organizing that. And then we realized there were some problems in the organization. And so we kind of left. And then when we hooked up again, he was like, hey, I want to do something like that, but for but as a company. And so that's the, I guess the kind of, that was kind of the inception of the Kinetic experience. And then we've been doing that for sure. a year now. Yeah, that was definitely when you came in yeah. to have a conversation. Yeah. And then, yeah, we've been, we've been. But yeah, I mean, in general, I research things. And if there's something to be found out, I research it and figure out how to do it. And so that's kind of every startup that I've ever been part of, it's been from how do we do X? And I'm like, well, let me go find out and report back to you. And then something comes up. But also good on strategy. Yeah, yeah. Like just strategically looking at a situation. 
Right, and figuring out like what can be done, how do we fit into a market, what ways we can address, which is actually how we got to the whole thing with Twitch, which is business, business and startups is usually talked about at such a high level that most people don't get down to the nitty gritty and they don't talk about it for anything like less than like the next Twitter. And so this is kind of a space where more people could find engagement and value if we're just talking about general business and starting any type of company as opposed to like, well, this is how you do a tech company. So. Yeah, just really, and, and also our uh, our motivation is showing how the sausage is made. Yeah, which Says is the vegetarian. Like I we was eat computing that whole analogy. <laughs> we eat vegetarian sausage too. Just gonna I mean, put a plug in there for Beyond Beef's uh, oh. Beyond Meats. No. Oh. Ve- vegan sausage. Huh, do they have amazing. a video on how so their sausage green. is made? It's the same shit. Yeah. It's just goo stuck through a tube. What, what do you? Processes. Yeah, it just happens to be soy instead of. Okay, that makes sense. Anyways, it's the weird parts of the soy that you don't want to eat, it's like versus soy the anus or something. Soy anus. Ew. Is <laughs> soy anus. Is that even a thing? Oh my thing? god. How did we? How did we get <laughs> Emily, because I said yeah. sausage it's, it's, and she went berserk. Yeah, this is how things go with Emily. You never know what's going to come out of her mouth. It's awesome. Uh, so yeah, really just showing how how things are done and our our evolution through an idea or our evolution through a situation. I mean, and we, I mean, so because we've had these questions, we also need to add this to the bottom of our channel page so that there is a description about the people that you frequently see on the channel. Oh yes, yeah. for sure. You know what's going to be great is that as as different people rotate into the office, like when we have. Jason Osborne here, or AJ Amex, or any any of these individuals, you know, as they work with us through a situation too, because that'll be really fun, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. And maybe in the future, there's a way we can even do a screen share on, on this software. I don't know. Right. Because so sometimes we as we work through certain kinds of like documents, even like this is the challenge. So right now, one of the challenges that we're working through is putting a proposal in that's a multi-part training proposal. And that's the one that I've been working on um, since last week with Janica. Mm-hmm. You know, it's thinking through where an organization is now and wh- where they want to get to, and what are the different trainings they need. And that's easy, right? But the really difficult part is how can we make sure that the trainings actually stick, right, and are effective for what they're trying to accomplish. Right. How do we measure the effectiveness, and how do we make sure that they are helping them create the habitual actions related to the trainings? So communicate the different communication styles, meeting, you know, running a meeting, problem solving. Yeah. Uh, that's what's interesting for us uh, right now. Yeah, and especially not making it a uh, another just box that gets checked by management and then you move on and nothing actually gets changed. Right, because then, yes, then what, what will happen there and what we don't want to have happen, obviously, is that we end up just with making money on the deals, but the clients are not ultimately really happy. Right. right. But we want companies that are growing and thriving, so they, of course, become powerful referral engines for us. Should I open my UPS box now? What? My UPS box? Box! My artwork! (laughs) You want to unbox your artwork? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, I mean, obviously there's an interesting story behind that. Well, I, yes, so actually, actually this particular, this particular. Uh, The other one, that's the old one. Yeah. That's the new one, yeah. So, the gentleman I met through my, my social smoke days, his name is Horace. And he's an artist. I follow him on Facebook. We're friends, and I and I love his artwork. He's uh, out of I think near like Atlanta, in Georgia. Robert, Fayetteville. How to put that picture of Janie? Fayetteville, Georgia. Which what? That picture of Janie. Like, and so, anyways, he did this artwork. Oh my God! And I thought I need this because we had been ta- I've been talking about. <laughs> the craziness that has been recently happening with all these massive brands being either so tuned out or something. Isn't I don't that know. Funny? <laughs> what are y'all? 1991. Th- Jennifer found an old picture. Oh, she marked it up. that's anyway. the thing that that's the thing that I from my yearbook I was referring. You really to. have an age. That's what I said. She's an ageless monster. That's I totally pretty amazing. Agree. Anyway, so. Continue the unboxing. <laughs> yeah, I don't even know why that has to do with anything. Janica. I had sent it. I didn't say anything. I just sent it. Whatever. So, yes. So, y'all, y'all ready for this? Yeah. Oh, yeah. See, look. It's even, it's even signed and everything. Da, da, da. So. Oh, my gosh. No. <laughs> That's 
That's not what I That's not expecting. going up on our wall, right? Yeah, why not? For reasons. This is to remind us to not be dumb as shit when we go to release any products. It kind of looks like another like, ghost from Pac-Man. I know, right? It does. Yeah. I love it. There's just there's a lot of there's a lot of things in there because like so you so the reason I love the fact that he made it look like the ghost from Pac-Man. And he's by the way black, so he's not also. So <laughs> Horace is black. So there's black a people can be racist. Well this is true, but yeah, of course, black people can be racist, but, but they can anyway, be racist. Anyways. Yeah, self-effective. So one of the reasons why I love the fact that he made right. it look like one of the ghosts from Pac-Man is because that also used to be a uh, racial slur about black people. No. So, yeah, called spooks. Yeah. That's so, true. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. specifically around like the 40s and the 50s. Because, and I don't know if this was because of the fact that cameras didn't pick people up or it was like bad photography, but like, you know, think about it. Like, if you take a bad picture of a black person with bad lighting, you're not going to see shit. So, <laughs> yeah, I get you your point. Beautiful smile. Yeah. Well, that happens to me a lot, too. There you go. So, when I think. <laughs> I gotta just, watch the backlight. Gotta watch the backlight. <laughs> like, I love the fact that, like, it's got that. Because you know what he's talking about with the Gucci reference, right? Oh, but yeah. Then it also has, like, this other secondary connotation that you can throw in there. But it, that actually is a test of who knows their history. Good one. Yeah, I think it's a very complex yeah. thing. There's a lot going on there. And if you don't know what happened during the very, very beginning of 20, I think it was February 2019. Yes, yes. Right, February. Yeah. February 2019, you wouldn't understand the Gucci reference. Right. And which is, which is so much of it. But then, like you said, there's this other element to it. Yeah. So, I don't know. And we should totally have Horace on to talk about that. Absolutely. He would be an amazing yeah, becoming be Da Vinci. So I reached out to him. I made a topic about who would be interested on, on talking about how they take notes. Mm -hmm. And that would, and then he reached out to me on that one. So we need to do a Becoming Da Vinci episode just on note taking and figuring out how we can do notes By and stuff way, like that. What if they can see the Becoming Da Vinci show? Ah, of course. That's Becoming true. Da Vinci show. Well, you can, of course, go to YouTube and... Um, Type in Becoming Da Vinci and you'll see all our episodes there. And also our, our website is becomingdavinciShow.com. So that show is all around Leonardo da Vinci or using Leonardo da Vinci as this kind of scaffolding in which we, we have conversations around things like his, his attributes, innovation, creativity, imagination, being a misfit and a rebel, uh, a lot of different things, being, being innovative. Literally all the most amazing things possible that are really not cultivated in the United States very strongly, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Versus in countries like Finland and Denmark that their whole, their whole system is geared for promoting that. Um, yeah, explore, they, they, that exploration of like what you can be as... I think it was somebody was just telling me that they were surprised to learn that, and I think it's Finland, that, that they don't start learning how to read till they're seven years old. Really? Yeah. yeah uh, it's, it's older I, than that. I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's much older because right here in pre-K, they're starting to learn, right? Oh, uh, you're talking about, so like the formalized, like push toward reading. Yes, the formalized push to reading. Gotcha. It's gotcha. really, it's older than that. So like, did they also say anything in, I mean, was there any information about do kids come into that formalized reading experience with a prior knowledge of how to read just based on being around their family or is it? There's a bunch of different, like it's been a few years since I studied that. Um, 2015 I've put a lot of time in it. So there were a bunch, a bunch of different articles about it and, and concepts. So you either have those kids and those yeah. families who are just like, just do what you want to do and learn through experience. Oh, it's actually, they don't start school till they're seven. Yes. Oh. Like it's, not it's even it's any not school. Pushed. One of the people commenting is from Finland, so we could just ask them. Oh, ask. Yes. Yes. Oh, snap. So. Oh, that's exciting. So what did you I'm do from you Finland. School? Well, I told you, I just Googled that. Well, no, uh, that's what I'm saying. We like Google, but. With a but person. But with a person. I know, it's amazing. <laughs> I'm just. It's like series real. So, did, so yeah, ask. Um, Ask when they started school. Uh, Emily, you wanted to do that one. Emily, you take over, Emily. Well, probably, they, I mean, they already uh, heard you, so. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I know, but is that, is, can you confirm that it's seven years old? <laughs> you jackasses. Jose! No, I'm oh. Saying, I'm saying. What? Listen, Ron Howard. There's also a 20 second delay in here, so. Oh, yeah, that's true. So, like, whatever we're asking. Yeah, so be. thanks, fuck well, faces. We should say it, and then we'll just count I knew 20, this. and then, like, so, but if you type instantly, it'll be immediate, not 20 seconds later. Okay, Formal so. Formal school starts at seven years old. How about reading? 20 second delay, so maybe you can type that out. 
I think it's amazing. I want to go to Finland. Super bad. Speaking of super bad. Yeah. The movie. Oh no. Mm -mm. I mean, there's there's so many there's so many things in the Nordic countries that I want to explore, right? So like, um, like so, obviously fjords because fjords have um, are amazing photographic just Mm -hmm. opportunities. Say that again. The fjords. What's that? Big river. F J O R. Yeah, it's it's the rivers outflow into the ocean and they cut through. So like, it's been around. I don't I don't know how. Depending on whether or not you're a creationist or evolutionist, there's been some millions of years that these rivers have been flowing through and they've cut into the rocks. So they have these really massive, steep walls and the rivers flow out into the base. Amazing. And so, basically how everything looks in Lord of the Rings. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. Basically, yeah. Everything, how everything looks in Lord of the Rings. So you get these ran- these massively beautiful like waterfalls and... Can you come in that one? You know, Here, it's I'm just, putting it's an, it's an awesome thing to like see and it doesn't really exist I'm like coming else. to guy. So I'm that's amazing. Um, yeah. So that's and then also f- the Nordic countries have really really good coffee, and so that's the mm. other. I think it seems like they do everything <laughs> epic. Yes. Yes. Dying to go to Finland. And they're beautiful, beautiful people. Just from an aesthetic standpoint, like it seems like everything is perfectly symmetrical. I don't understand how that works. <laughs> yeah, you know genetics. <laughs> so we start learning here at. Uh, uh, well, I mean, like. Four when you're in pre-K. Yeah, I mean. So pre-kindergarten here is starting at age four. Yep. And so you start learning that, and then you learn formal reading. I think, of course, right after that, starting in in kindergarten mm-hmm. as a five-year-old. Yes. Right. So depending if you're if you're not born in the summertime, then you start kindergarten as a six-year-old. Yes. Right. Yes. I was four, so. I, I mean, it it day. goes back and forth. Anyway, somewhere yeah. right in there between four. And it depends on public between or private. Between five and six. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and that's where you start yeah. actually learning how to read. In a very formalized structure, which is really different than a self-directed, where in this case Finland taking a seven-year-old. There's a big, big difference There's between a, a huge, five-year-old and a seven-year-old. Huge. Yeah. Right. Well, and right. really, kids aren't even developmentally ready, especially boys, until nine and ten to read. Or seventeen, or forty-two, or really? Right. Ever. Yes. Yes. Huh. Like when you read, and I don't know if it's Peter Gray or uh, Holt. They talk about it in their books about really developmentally, especially boys. Those first like nine to twelve years. Um, ooh, it's Andrew Purdue that talks about it. Those first nine to twelve years, they have with inner ear issues. They can't really like even sit yeah. and pay attention. Like they can't do both. So you'll see them. Hmm. It's an inner ear thing. So in order for them to pay attention, they're like this, or they're like hanging off of stuff and whatever. And then they can pay attention because they're not having to balance and stuff. So that also goes into the reading. Like if you have to sit and focus and read. That's true. I did most of my reading when I was a kid, like laying down. Yep. All of my boys upside down on the couch. Yep. Yep. Feet up, hanging off of stuff. So, but here's the, here's the amazing thing, right? Finland ranks number third in the 2019 Bloomberg Innovation Index. Number Hmm. three. Tiny country in and relative to the United States, which is the size of Minnesota. Right. But that right. makes sense because of the fact that, like, you have a concentration of... Amazingness. Well, but also, you, it's, a, it's a concentration of, like, culture and, like, like I guess we call it purpose, but it's not purpose. It's just, like, everyone has a similar, like, outlook. Yes. It's kind of the same thing like Japan. Japan has a very, like... Cultural identity. So, yeah. So, South, uh, South Korea is number one. Germany went from four to two, so they're number two right now. Okay. Finland went from seven to three. Right. It's an epic jump. Watch Mm -hmm. this. So number four, Switzerland, Mm -hmm. then Israel, then Singapore, then Sweden, United States. So we are now number 11. No, we're number eight. We used to be We're back in the top 10. Yay, go us. And then Japan. How did that happen? Because I feel like based on the last two years, (laughs) like we- just declaring ourselves the Snapchat. (laughs) Yeah. Snapchat. Hey, we have a lot of cruise missiles. You said this is from Forbes? Mm -hmm. No, No, uh, Bloomberg. 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 I'm putting it in the, in the- Because, you you know, know, Forbes gets things wrong, like certain people's net worth. So I'm just saying like- And Denmark, uh, Denmark is number 11. Austria 12, Belgium 13, Ireland 14, the Netherlands 15. So, and look at this one, Norway is 17. Mm -hmm. Uh, Look at how many upper European countries, right? Rank in the top 17. That is a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Right, Norway, Netherlands, Belgium, Austria, Denmark. Finland, Sweden, Finland. 
And Finland's She's kicking really ass. Smart. That's amazing. I mean, Look at their education system. Right. That's what we think. Right. Like, shouldn't we learn? Yes. I mean, ponder, the, research, figure out. I med- feel. I feel like we should, and I really feel like that's more of a testament to, like, everyone figuring out what is right for them, as opposed to everyone being forced into a specific type of structure. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes, that's what. Okay. Yeah. When you said right for them, like what by by country or what's well, the- well, I mean inside of a country, but then also by country. Also, like we have, I think we bought into the regiment the the regimented educational system a little bit too heavily, be, but without studying the factors that were actually making our country innovative, right? Because I mean, as everyone pretty much has accepted, most of the really key innovations and the amazing like discoveries and stuff have happened in non-standard methods right now they've been implemented by people with higher education but for the most part like the idea itself was a bunch of people that were just trying things so i feel like we've like over optimized toward the formal regimented education and not allowed enough room for experimentation yeah just yeah i think you know the more we can create alternative education models that there's a variety of them. They're not all the same, the, the different models. And then really help kids find and families find what fits them best. Because you look at some kids are really big innovators. And others are, they, yeah. they do want to follow a structure and a plan. And they really aren't those out-of-the-box thinkers. And, and allowing people, basically giving people the validation that like whichever path they choose is right for them. Yes, Cause, absolutely. You know, we find... We find that actually, there's a good and there's a good question in the chat. Why is China not on the list? It's on the list. Oh, where's it at? Um, I will tell you right now. It, but with the whole, um, I feel like that's one of the things that like we all really coalesced here around here is that because formal edu- China is number sixteen. Uh huh. It was number nineteen, and now it's now number sixteen. Interesting. So it's the Netherlands, China, Norway, UK, Australia, Canada, Italy, Poland. That's the top twenty-two. Hmm. So China's China's um, definitely becoming way way more innovative, which makes sense, and I, I could see them China getting leads into the top ten. Doesn't China lead the United, in the world right now in, in the supercomputer category? Uh, yes, but it's it's a it's almost like the trillionaire, you know, blue, uh, Gates and then Bezos back and forth on like who's richer. Well, not, not even if there were number two, let's just yeah. say that's no, no, still no, an no, epic are. accomplishment. That's what I'm saying. So they were number one for. Uh, a couple of weeks, and then Google just dropped a new computer, supercomputer that put them at number one. I just read something that the computing power is like one billion times a billion for the new for the, for new, the new one. Yeah, like yeah. if you multiply a billion by a billion or something like that, you yeah. get to the number of computations that it can do per second. And number two, the number two largest one was at UT. That was so. Whoa! Cool. Yeah. Really? So UT has well now UT has number the number three largest supercomputer. China has number two, and then Google has number one. And I wouldn't be surprised if in another eighteen months China comes out with another one that surpasses that because it's really just it's a matter of like scaling it as opposed to like the possibility of doing it. If mm. that makes sense. Mm. Wow. Well, I think interesting that we're on Twitch, and it should be stated that I've recently have found. Um, well, actually, let's stay on China for a second. The United States is, is embargoing China with exporting really high-end uh, processors to China. Yes, because they're... So all of a sudden, China has a need to learn how to do this and produce but what's nanometer in, what, What's also interesting chips. about that is it, it's interesting that the United States is trying to embargo China or embargo companies from exporting that tech to China. But the base components that you need to build most of those tech is mined in China. You mean the the resources? Yeah, like the actual like elements that. You yeah, need yeah, that's to, fine. To, but the 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 machines to make yes, the shit yes, and the technology yes. there is. I I learned it's uh, Austria. I think it's Austria and the United yeah. States produce the machines to mm-hmm. be making to make the wafers to even do this stuff. But the, I, so China's had to been like, oh shit! So I need to figure this stuff on my own, which is going to drive a whole yes. industry of independence out of that. Or, you know, and, and it's a delaying tactic, really. That's, that's it really, is just a delaying tactic. Yeah. Same same with the whole Huawei versus uh, the United States on the communications tech for the 5G, 5G. networks. It, it's a delaying tactic because of the fact that what we are worried about them doing is what we want to do. Yes. So it's just like who gets their infrastructure in place first. 100%. And China's already proven they want to outspend us everywhere. 
So they're giving away all the tech to be able to be the person that has the next generation communications network. So that's yeah, absolutely true. But anyways, going back to what I was saying, like it's interesting that we're on Twitch, mm -hmm. which is primarily used by gamers, right? Which right. Gaming is in and of itself a form of can be a form of education. Oh, it's definitely a form of education. I have been shocked so that my four year old, uh, our four year old, he has taken to my iPad. It started off with him playing on, on I would drop Spider-Man cartoon coloring pages in Notability mm -hmm. and he would color them. And I learned that he was able to color, he would actually focus and spend so much more time coloring yep. there than he would if it was uh, the old school paper and crayola. Yeah. Just phenomenal. Like he will actually spend time to really focus in, he changes the colors, you know, and it's neat to watch him use the technology and to go through it and changing the, the, yeah, the color totally and the that, point right? of the brush and all of that. Scarlett does the yeah. same. So I made the mistake of saying, oh, we can drop a Lego game on there. Before you know it, we had him like shooting dinosaurs and all these all these different games, right? Yeah. Yes. Now, the Lego games are awesome. All the Lego games are pretty oh, awesome. they're so fun. So there are some pretty cool games. And then there was the fact that he stopped doing the artwork stuff. Yes. So I took that away. I was like, no, you cannot only just play the games. You can play the games and you can do the art. So now he goes back and forth between them. But... Mm -hmm. But I ended up actually spending time to focus on buying him games that he wanted that had a, a big educational component. So one was yes. ABC Mouse. Of course, you probably know that one, right, Jane? Oh, yeah. We paid for that for years. I, I just learned that that was like a big thing. That has the whole game platform there. Everything that a kid touches is an educational moment. Yes. Everything. Yes. From Spanish to in music, everything. So, like, you know, the next level for him is like once he hits uh, like middle school would be to start playing games like Civilization. Yes. Yeah. That's geography and economic resource management and like, you know, diplomacy and just figuring out like the basics of how countries work in certain cases or just how, like how large entities work. Like those are things that if he starts, you know, early enough, once he gets to the place where he needs to like be part of projects or like run teams, you know, just do collaborative work with other people, like he's always got this concept of like managing at a large level. It's really amazing. Really amazing to see how he takes to learning on the iPad and how much he's interested in, in exploring different games and different mm -hmm. topics. And of course, I mean, kudos to the people that are, are, you know, have created some of these game platforms. One of them he downloaded yesterday was on Anatomy. And so it shows like food going down the esophagus, the stomach churning, it allows you to see inside the stomach and not the, the intestines, the lungs. And he's like, oh look, that's how the lungs work. Hey, what's that? That's the diaphragm. What does that work? How is that on me? And right. here's the bones and just super sick. So talk about on your comment on screen time. We've got some comments about screen time and mm. how it's mm. not good. So. Well, yeah, but we yeah. don't. No, no, no. <laughs> and, but but I but I totally agree with the comment here. I, we we don't let them stay on the screens very long at all. So yeah. it's, it's and just I have that, a different mindset. So well, I was say, I yeah, that, we so should I'm talk to you. <laughs> no, and, and I, I don't let him spend too much time on it. And so when he's on it, it's like a treat. Mm -hmm. And so he needs to. Sp in my opinion, it'd be better if he uses it for, like I said, coloring or some of the educational games in there, right. rather than some of the more mindless stuff. In my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, so because you think, can get really lost in the mindless stuff because it's fun and it's well, and especially nowadays it's engineered for like straight up dopamine hits. So right. that's, what I'm saying, right. that's what I'm saying. Right, especially YouTube and all those channels. But I would say definitely the younger, younger, maybe six, seven, eight, like up until that age, limiting the time on screens, is, and especially under four. I, if, oh, I think yeah. if if my kids grew up now where it was like it is. The limiting, I mean, because we did, we limited TV, we limited a lot when they were little. Right. But right. when they hit that, I want to say eight, nine, ten, really. The self actualization age? Yes. Like, that's when I took my hands off of limiting their screen time and they started self regulating. Like, it took a while. There was this huge, like, oh my gosh, every single moment. But right. then they self regulated. And then you would see, like, especially Grant and Scarlett and Evan, because they were younger at that time, they would go out, play outside come in, do some craft, eat, whatever, get on the computer, get on the TV, get on whatever, they go back outside. And so they created their own rules around it. And and whereas, you know, with Scotty as the oldest, he had restrictions up until he was probably 12, 13 time mm -hmm. period. So it was a different world. And I, and I think for him, it was harder for him to learn the self-regulation. Oh, because of the fact that we had always controlled it. But I think it's so a, he didn't have to think about it, and then once he had to like do his own management, it yeah, the curve it is took longer. longer. Yeah. Whereas like, but but then you think of Scarlett with all of her 
diagnoses. The, the ability to get herself off of screen time, if it's really in one of those things that just sucks her in, mm -hmm. it's hard, to, it, she gets addicted into it. Mm. But I think on the other side, because she is so hyper and active that she needs to get out, she will get to the point where she's antsy and she puts it down and will spend hours outside. So it's like she puts that same effort into both. Gotcha, yeah, yeah. So. I, for me, my experience was similar, but I spent most of my time I spent most of my time in like mixed type environments because what I mostly focused on was like I was, you know, it was my Lego sets, right? Right. But then it was the adjoining programs that went with the Lego sets, specifically with the Mindstorm sets for the computer. So most right. of my screen time was involved programming the robot and then letting the robot do stuff and then testing outside. I love that. So That's awesome. And, and then, you know, so I would do a lot of that and then I would come in and play like strategy yeah. games. So it was right. kind of a, it was kind of a dual combined piece, which actually stopped me from watching as much TV because I was like, well, A, we had a really early version of TiVo so I could watch TV at my own pace whenever yeah. I wanted to. So that, like my parents used that. They're like, well, you have this much time, but if you want to devote all of your TV time to watching this one show, we'll just like record everything. And then you can watch oh, that. Watch it in. Yeah, right. that's smart. Well, there's a, uh, this is a good comment here. The digital uh, when you Aww. use an educational app, suddenly apps pop, uh, apps pop up with adult ads. Yeah. Yeah. So what I found, it, and that's why I wanted to change the apps that he was playing. So he wanted to play uh, a superhero game. So yeah, no Spider-Man, mm -hmm. right? And then the other one was he had this dinosaur game. Let me think through. There was I don't know. There was maybe one other one. That's Eleven Eleven, guys. So what happened is those games want you to buy fuck tons of stuff, like constantly spending money. By spend this money, much money to get gold. And if you don't yeah, want to yeah. do that, watch yeah. this video. And I was like, yeah. it's constant. So yeah. either I'm going to have to fund, you know, it's this $500 gaming thing right now or take the app away because he's constantly running these bullshit ads and they pop up like every two minutes yes. and he's retarded. Yes. Yeah, that, so I got I that, that out of the way and I'm like, let me pay for an app that doesn't have that nonsense in it anymore. And I can regulate it a little bit better because he doesn't know what's happening. He's just constantly seeing this stuff. Right, right. And I love the fact, you know, this comment here about screen time. I totally agree. I, I love him having a box of Legos around or some blocks mm -hmm. and that's it. It's like, well, yeah. you can play with that or be bored or go outside. Like, these are yeah. your options. And he, all of a sudden, you'll find out he's lost and he's lost in imaginary land and he's just playing games yes. by himself. Yeah. And yes. he's putting the Legos together. He's building blocks because... I don't fill his time up and I don't let it, you know, be in front of the screen or whatnot. Yeah. I mean, well, I recreated a lot of my strategy games in my Legos. That's amazing. Like, because I was limited on screen time and also uh, I think we only had like two computers. So like half the time, it was the, the general purpose family thing. So I was like, well, I really like Command and Conquer. I'm going to make all of the pieces in Lego and then play chess with them basically as opposed to being able to play it on the computer. And then, so that was my like tactics adaptation time. Yeah. And I also like military history. So I'd read stuff and be like, oh, let's do a diorama of like, you know, like yep. the Battle of the Bulge, but in Lego. That's so, exactly what Scotty and Evan would do. I mean, they learned so much history and war principles and strategy and communication skills mm -hmm. all through in management. I mean, their project management skills blow me away just from playing video games. Yes. And yes. doing that where they would then take it into, like, because Scotty has such an imagination, he would take everyone outside and they would create this in real life yep. <laughs> and manage everyone. And you'd see Evan with the strategy and Scotty, like, managing everyone and Grant being whatever monster he wanted to be. So, <laughs> Grant Rex, Rex, yep. So, <laughs> It is. They take it and they apply it. But you yeah. have to give them that freedom to do that. Yes. Yes. There is a there is an element of not having the idea, not pre-deciding what your kids are going to do yes. and how they're going to turn out yep. and kind of like listening a little bit to figure out like what is it, that, what feedback are they giving you? Right. That's key. I don't know, yeah. Too many parents don't do that. too much obsession. Like, oh, my kids will be bored. It's like, no, they won't. No. Let them be bored. I love it when they're bored because that means that at some point they have to figure out what they're going to do to fill that. Yeah, either they're going to yes. fall into a coma or they're going to figure out something to yes. do. And if you just back off, I bet you they'll think of something to do all by themselves. And they do. And then sometimes you over-optimize and you get suspended for reading in class. Well, there's that. <laughs> I think people thought I was dumb. Over-optimize. Like, read in yeah. class with people because I would be like eight pages ahead and, and then oh, like, okay, it's your it's turn to read. And I'm like, I have no fucking idea where we are because I finished this book two days ago. Yeah. Yeah. That was I always too. knew where everybody was because I was so scared to get called on because I couldn't read out loud very well. 
Mm. And so I wasn't very excited. <laughs> like, like, oh, I'm the fifth me. paragraph. But I got to read plus or minus a paragraph because if somebody skips or they read too much. Oh, my so. God. How did you deal with that? Weren't you, like, stressed out? I was always stressed out. I hated the reading that was done. Um, yeah, I didn't like settings. outside reading. I mean, loud reading because. Uh, I never minded it. I just was like, okay, where are we? So the, they would just basically, it's always starting to just, like, say where we are because, like, I I, I could read it, and you I was read where I am, but I'm very, not the same book as you. I, well, that too. But my problem would be, I just hated people looking at me and paying attention to me. And so it was like, <laughs> why? Why, why can't struggle. we just skip me? I know how to read. <laughs> <laughs> That's not my struggle. Obviously, yeah. not our struggle now. Yeah, we're, well, it's, it is. It's different for us. So we should definitely probably like wrap this one. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it was great. Uh, let's see here. So what's our what's our topic for the next room? So tomorrow it is... But it's not that we have a topic. It's just that we always felt it'd be great that we have this underlying core element right, right. that so, we can relink back to. Yeah, so, so I feel like we should uh, talk about that at the yeah. end so yeah, no, people it's great. know what's coming up. Tomorrow is all about finances. So your income and your plan That's what we're talking about. So that's oh, okay. planning as in the sense of future life. Like, what you want your money to do. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. So that'll be for, that's kind of the underlying part for tomorrow. Maybe that we can get some questions from the lawyer. Oh, yeah. The tax man. The tax man. Mm, Got to have money to worry about the taxes, so let's worry about that one first. So do we want to wrap up goals or a purpose with, um, you know, like where we feel like we are with that or any help with people to people? Suggestions? You want Smart to talk a little bit about Smart the kinetic goals. will or something? Just, yeah, we have the kinetic. Goal, maybe. Yeah. yeah, we have the kinetic wealth will, which covers 10 key resources that we've broken down into two each. So like today we're covering purpose, which covers impact and goals. And we feel that these resources are what will give you a, an abundant life, an optimal life. And we call them it our wealth will because we believe wealth is, um, uh, what is well, it? We don't, it's not that we believe, I mean, wealth is money, wealth, possessions and resources. Energy, all of that, and, yeah. And yeah. Having an abundance of all of that. Having an abundance what, of resources. Right. Yeah. And so we want to have a balanced, optimal life that fits with you instead of like what one of our friends said. What did he say? Miserably rich. Miserably rich. Uh, yeah. 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 So that is the purpose of the wealth will to help us uh, make assessments of our lives and then set goals and reflection on that and just keep working towards building that optimal life that we each want. It's awesome. Cool. Awesome. Thanks, everybody, for the comments. This was amazing. Thank yeah. you so much. Okay, A lot of feedback. We are also live on, on Instagram if you want to say hi or anything. Hello. Oh. Hey, what's hi, up, Instagram? Instagram. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Join us on Twitch tomorrow at 10 a.m. Central. Yes. Right? Yes. Or 10.07 or whatever. Or whenever we get on. <laughs> <laughs> We're figuring this out. Still going to be 10. Yeah. All right. 10-ish. Denton time. All right. And then... That's a wrap. Mm -hmm.